Okay, cool. So today's lecture, we're talking about revenue. We're talking about IFRS 15, uh, and that's the revenue standard. And so the, the standard's name, we're going to get into the name a little bit more in detail, but it's a sort of a long-winded name, uh, a revenue from contracts with customers. And, and th that's sort of important, and that's going to lead into our discussion a little bit later. In the meantime, uh, we just want to, oops, we've gone too far. I just want to sort of show you what we're going to be discussing today. So in today's lecture, what I want you to walk away with is I want you to be able to uh, have the basic definitions of uh, revenue. So just the basics of revenue, right? So we're going to be talking about that. I need to change that color. Uh, basic definitions of revenue. Um, and then I'm going to be contrasting for you in a few minutes the difference between uh, revenue and income. Right? So that's an important concept. What's the difference between revenue and income? Very important. And so we'll, we'll chat about that today. And then we're going to start with um, outcome three today. However, we're not going to finish. We're probably going to finish this uh, outcome three next week, Thursday. So it'll take us about a week to do the whole of outcome three. Uh, and that's because that's where the bulk of the work is, right? And then the final outcome, which is talking a little bit about presentation, is sort of something that you sort of will pick up while we do uh, uh, outcome three. So outcome three and four sort of happen at the same time. Uh, and we will have a brief discussion about it a little bit later. So that's sort of um, our plan. The idea behind uh, and, and what sort of I expect you to be able to do after the lecture, right? I want you to be able to discuss and calculate um, revenue firstly. And then in terms of the presentation, you must be able to pass journal entries and record it in the financial statements, okay? Now there's going to be sort of this big discussion that happens, what is revenue, when is it uh, uh, recorded? And that's why I say, that's why I put discuss first because this specific topic is going to be a little bit heavy on the theory and, and you, there's going to be like criteria and that sort of stuff that you need to apply. So it's important that we get that discussion down and get the discussion uh, correct because if we are able to discuss and rationalize and if we have that why question, if the why question is answered, right, then we're not going to have a big issue with the how. The calculating and the recording is not is not the main uh, 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 sort of thing in this topic, right? And you're going to see that certain topics will be heavy on calculation. Um, for example, next we're going into inventory. The calculation is important in inventory, whereas here the discussion is more important uh, uh, than than the calculation. So I want you to pay careful attention to 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 that element of uh, this topic. So um, we want to get the why question asked, because if we get the why question, sorry, not asked, answered, if we get the why question answered, we're going to be way better at, 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 the, at the how, right? So at the, at the journal entries and such. Scope exclusions. Um, so we I've put this slide up on ClickUp um, this morning because some people were just, they were just too tired to, to open the slides and find it themselves. But uh, so I put it up this morning. Um, and basically what I want to say is, okay, so today we're not gonna do 5.7. And I know that all of you all have read your textbooks because I told you to read your textbooks in the work plan. So I know everyone knew this already, <laughs> but we're not doing 5.7. Uh, and then on Tuesday, we're going to do section seven, but we're leaving out a big, a major chunk of section seven. So we're leaving out from page 148, uh, almost entirely all the way to 170, right? And then there's a few pages in between that we will read, but, um, but the majority of that we're leaving out. In fact, even before that, 144. From 144 to 170, um, the majority of that is going to be is going to be left out. So just be aware of that. And that's for your weekend reading. So I expect you guys to sort of read that on Friday and over the weekend. 
um, and to be prepared for Tuesday's uh, lecture. Um, and then after that, if you look at from page 198, we are sort of not doing too much um, until the end of the chapter, right? So from 198 to basically the end of the chapter, we're not doing too much. There will be a little bit that we'll talk about in presentation. Um, but but for the majority of that, we're not we're not focusing on it uh, in detail. However, at the end of all of the chapters in Gripping Gap, you're going to find that there's um, a really a very nice summary that is done, and and they sort of do do it in these tables um, uh, at the end of all of the chapters. And I want to encourage you to please go through those summaries if you need a crash course on what is going on. Um, so please, please, please make sure that you go through the summaries um, at the end of each chapter. And so even though I'm saying that we're not gonna be doing too much work at the end of the chapter, I want you to, to not forget about the summary, okay? Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about revenue and and income okay so this is this sort of was slide six um in in your in your um in your slides and so basically the way i want you to view revenue is that i want you to view revenue as um a part of income Income is the massive bucket, the way I call it, the way I say it is, it's a bucket that holds many different things, right? And so income is the bucket and inside the income bucket, we've got things like uh, uh, rental income, we've got things like, um, you know, uh, um, investment income, we've got revenue, we've got all of these different types of incomes in the income bucket. So not all money that's coming into the entity is revenue, okay? The key is that revenue is from ordinary activities. Whereas when we look at income, we talk about an increase in economic benefits, right? And, and, and we characterize that increase as either a, a, an increase in assets or decrease in liabilities, right? Um, but we don't actually mention anything about where it's coming from. So the important thing about revenue is it's the source of the income. The source is ordinary activities. Whereas with income, we just say, oh, there's, there's money coming into the business. So income is just everything coming into the business. Whereas revenue is money coming into the business from an ordinary activity source. Does that make sense? All right? So, so the, the key is, is where is uh, sort of where is income coming from? Where is revenue coming from? At least it's coming from ordinary activities, from ordinary activities that are being done. So that's the important bit, and that's sort of the, the thing that we need to focus on here is is to understand where uh, uh, this income is coming from. There, there are going to be situations where, um, uh, for example, in our tests and exams and in tutorial questions, where you're going to get something. For example, like a company that rents out uh, accommodation to students. A company is created, it rents out accommodation to students. So the question is, is that money that it's getting as rental, is it rental income or is it revenue? Right? Your answer is going to be typed out in the chat. I want you to either type out rental or revenue um, to sort of explain what what it is right All right so so if a company is created and it's its purpose the company's purpose is to rent um accommodation to students from up is that money that's coming in rental or is it revenue and the answer is it's revenue and the reason why it's revenue is because it's from their ordinary course of business, okay? And so it, 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 that's what their purpose is, right? However, if we have a company that, let's say, um, you, you know, they, they, they're manufacturing cell phones, uh, right? 
And then they've got some spare space at the back of the factory that they rent out. That is not their ordinary course of business. Their ordinary course of business is to, or the ordinary business activities is to create and sell cell phones. Right? That rental income that they come from renting out the small portion at the back of the factory is going to be considered rental income and it's not in revenue. Okay, so you gotta get, you gotta understand that idea of the ordinary course of business or ordinary business activities, right? And so this is why I got this calculation at the bottom. I say revenue plus other income that's non from non-ordinary activities, right? And those non-ordinary activities, remember, interest income, uh, um, uh, rental income, and then you can have other things, you know, other sorts of uh, stuff as well. So all of those other activities that create income, that when we add these two things together, when we when we when we um, uh, put them together, then they give us income as defined in the conceptual framework. Okay, so that's important. The difference between uh, uh, income and revenue uh, is that. Okay, now I want to go back and talk a little bit about um, revenue, right? So revenue, again, uh, IFRS 15 is entitled revenue from contracts with customers. Now we're going to get back to that. I want to refer you to um, page, I just want to make sure that the page number is right on this, on this slide. Yes, it is. Um, okay. So yes, so it's on page. So if you have a look here at the top of our screen, I... Um, I got the page number there for you. And then normally I put the page number at the bottom in a little book. So I put a little, um, it's supposed to be yellow, but it ended up being green. There's a, there's a little uh, book that you'll see on some of the slides. And that um, book at the corner, left-hand corner at the bottom is the page number. It tells you which page we're dealing with in the textbook so that you can sort of follow along if you want to. Uh, in the textbook, right? Um, anyway, so back to our story. So we said revenue um, only covers specific um, transactions. Now, the idea behind the IFRA standard is that it was created as a net to catch all of the other transactions that are not caught, right, by normal uh, uh, IFRA. So we've got different types of IFRA. Let's say we've got a situation where we've got lease contracts, uh, and, and then that will be caught by IFRS 17. We've got uh, uh, banks that that uh, uh, issue insurance, that will be caught by IFRS 4. And then once we go through all of the standards and we identify all of the standards that are taken care of by specific IFRS, uh, IFRSs, then whatever revenue is remaining will fall under IFRS 15. So it's the net that catches all other revenues. Notice I didn't say it's catching all other income. It's supposed to be catching all other revenues. Okay. So that's the important bit, right? So if it's covered by another standard, then, then IFRS 15 is not applicable. But if it's not covered by any other standard, then we need to at least look at IFRS 15 uh, to, to, to see if it is applicable. Okay. Then IFRS 15 is not applicable to a situation where Companies are operating in the same industry and they are sharing products, right? Sharing products mean there's a there's sort of a barter system that goes on. And so the example that's sort of very famous is, uh, you know, we've got two milk producers, two people that are producing uh, milk um, and, and they're competitors in the market, right? So, so they're not sort of... Uh, um, they're not the same company. They're two two competitors in the market, uh, but how? However, there's good relations between them. So we have a situation where one of the farmers or one of the producers runs out of milk. Okay, so he goes to his farmer friend and he says, "Listen, can you just borrow me a little bit of milk uh, so that I can supply my customers, right? Uh, and this will allow me not to lose these customers. And then later on, I'll pay you back, but I'll pay you back in milk." I'll give you back the milk that you lent me, right? And so that is what we'd call a non-monetary. So there's no money changing hands. It's a non-monetary transaction between entities in the same industry or same business, right? And that is not covered by IFRS 15. That is a type of bartering system. That's barter. Bartering means where you tr uh, transact without money, 
okay? And so, that, so that's a bartering type of system, and that's not covered in IFRS 15. Now, what IFRS 15 does cover is it, as it clearly says there, it's a revenue from contracts with customers. So there's two important things that it must have. It must have a contract and it must have a customer. All right, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Must have a contract, must have a customer. So the first thing is, and you're gonna see when we start talking more detail about, about the contract, the, it's very vague what a contract is, right? So it says it's an agreement, right? And, and, and the lawyers among us, the people that are doing BCom law, it'll say it's a meeting of the mind, it's a consensus of thinking, right? It's an agreement, right? So, so there's an agreement between two parties. Notice it, it wants us to have more than two. We mustn't, we mustn't have an agreement with ourselves. We can't have a contract with ourselves, right? Yeah. Contracts with ourselves are not covered by FS15. So it's, it's an agreement between two parties um, and that gives rise to some sort of obligations and in certain cases uh, rights, right? So we have obligations and rights because of this contract. And, and the main thing is from a legal perspective, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about legal stuff today a bit more than normal. From a legal perspective, it's enforceable by law. Okay, so that is the definition of a contract in IFRS 15. It's a very vague definition. I'm going to get into it a bit more, a little, little bit later, right? So just keep that in mind. Next thing is a customer, right? So a customer, again, cannot be yourself, okay? So, so it can't be, you can't have, you can't call yourself, a, I'm a customer, I'll, I'll buy my own things. That's not, that's not on. Um, so it can't be yourself and it can't be a related party to you, right? So that's not a customer. So it has to be some sort of entity that we do ordinary business with. Right? So the key there is ordinary business, and I have made not a very straight line um, on the on the screen, but but I have made a line. <laughs> so so it's ordinary business that we want to we want to try and focus on, right? So we are exchanging goods and services for some sort of ordinary business. That's the key. That's what we want to focus on. Um, okay, and then that gives rise to revenue. This is where that ordinary business activities come in. Uh, okay, and so IFRS 15 is a fairly new standard, fairly new. Um, it sets out five steps that we need to take in order to um, arrive at, at the recognition of revenue. Okay. Five steps that, that we need to follow in order to recognize the, the, sorry, I accidentally changed, in order to recognize the, the, the revenue. So the, the underlying principle is something that we were familiar with in the old standard. And the underlying principle is that we must record the substance of a transaction over the form. What does that mean? It means that a lot of the lawyers, um, can write a contract in very strange ways to try and trick the accountant. You see? So, so we need to not worry about the legal format or the legal form of the contract. Instead, we want to try and um, record the, the economic substance. What is really happening? Okay? Well, what is the, the real truth behind this contract? That's what we're aiming to do. And so in order to do that, we've got these five steps, right, to, 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 to help us along the way. Okay, and, and as everyone can sort of hear, uh, we are very angry with the, with the lawyers. And the reason why we are so unhappy with the lawyers is because they are getting their own, uh, uh, what you call it, series. And, and we call that series suits. Right, but whereas the accountants they don't have a series, and so therefore we're very angry with the lawyers because of that, and we're going to be um, sort of crapping on the lawyers a little bit today. Okay, so so uh, so uh, we how do we do this? how do we get around what the lawyers are doing in the contracts? Right, the first thing is we identify if the contract it does exist, and we even though the lawyers have their own sort of criteria for when a contract exists, we've come up with our criteria. 
okay? We've come up with our criteria and we're going to apply it to the contract and say, yes, it exists or no, it doesn't, right? So, so we sort of dictating, um, we, we're hoping to, the accountants were hoping to dictate to the lawyers when and how they should create their contracts. And so that's why the accountants come up with their own sort of criteria for when a, for when a contract exists or not, right? So we're going to talk about that today. That's sort of the meat of today's lecture. Um, and then in tomorrow's lecture, we're going to look a little bit about the, uh, at the performance obligations. Now, performance obligations is just a fancy word for saying uh, goods and services. So next to your next to performance obligations, you're going to write down goods and services, right? So we want to identify what are the goods and services, and we and, and the reason is we want to break them up into identifiable chunks, right? And so tomorrow's lecture is going to be mainly dealing with that identifiable or distinctness, uh, the, the chunks that we can break these, these goods and services up into. Okay, so we want to identify what are the goods and services in step two. In step three, um, we look at the, at the transaction price. Now again, it's, it's sort of the fight that we're having with the lawyers. You're going to see the lawyers are going to talk about a thing called the contract price, contract price, right? Whereas the accountants are now going to be talking about the transaction price. That you, you have to realize that these two prices are, are not going to be the same. They can be the same, but a lot of the time, because sort of this is, you're going to see it in tests and exams, a lot of the time, the contract price is not going to be the same as the transaction price, right? And that we're going to sort of do on Tuesday. Um, and uh, also on Tuesday, we're going to allocate um, the transaction price, which we found out in, in step three. We're going to start to allocate that to the stuff that we found in step two, right? So step four is very dependent on step one, as uh, on step two and three, okay? And what you will often see is that in your tests and exams, step two to four happen simultaneously. They happen at once, right? We, we sort of identify the, 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 the goods and services, and then we find out the price, and then we allocate the price. It sort of all happens very quickly. Um, okay. Uh, and then finally, we wait for the good and service to be delivered, right? And, and, and in accounting, we, we don't say delivered, we say satisfied. So the delivery is something that the auditors talk about, right? So here we're hating on the auditors also. So the auditors will talk about, you know, has the good been delivered? Has risks and rewards transferred? We talk about, uh, as accountants, have we satisfied the obligation? Okay, so so uh, we're going to identify and, and we're going to recognize and record uh, the revenue when we've satisfied the obligation. Okay, so that's sort of the, the, the five-step plan. Now, I want you to keep that five-step plan in mind because there's going to be other five-step things that we're going to deal with today. So, so just keep this, this is IFRS 15 as a whole, right? And then when we look at step one, there's going to be another five criteria within step one. Okay, so don't get confused. This is the whole picture. This is the big picture. Right. Now, again, because we don't like suits and we want um, something called, uh, ma, ma, basically what I'm saying is I'm pitching you guys a new series and instead of it being called suits it's going to be called calculators but uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about that later but anyway so so now what what i am saying is that we, we can have contracts right and 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 a lot of the times what you'll see is the lawyers will write up the contracts in such a way that it misleads us into thinking that there's more than one performance obligation. So, and we're gonna, we're gonna return to this topic again uh, towards the end of the lecture. But the idea is that we need to look for contracts that are similar in timing and in obligation, and we can combine them into one contract. So we can have a situation where we look at individual contracts, but we can also have a situation where we look at a group or a set of contracts, and we as accountants call them one contract, okay? So, so just keep that in mind. We can have one contract um, as a standalone, or we can have a group of contracts that we combine 
uh, into into one contract. So that's sort of important. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. Uh, but but when we're applying the five step uh, model, we can like I say apply it to one or many contracts at the same time. Right now, I want to uh, le let's just have a look at sort of where we are so far, right? Because we sort of on slide nine now. Um, where are we? What have we done so far in the lecture? So, so far we've sort of discussed the different definitions of, of revenue, like contract and customer, whatnot. And then we, we, we spoke a little bit about um, the difference between revenue and income. And now we get to this meaty thing, this thing that's going to last us for the next like week right and this is the understanding and the applying of the five-step model i'm just gonna pop the fan on here because i'm feeling hot okay so that's the five-step model that we want to we want to talk about right and so this is where the bulk of the work is going to sit for us today um so if we have a look we want to talk a little bit about step one and in step one we need to identify uh, a contract and we need to identify that the contract is taking place with a customer right remember keep in mind that key principle right that key principle is we want to make sure that we recognize the substance economic substance of the transaction over the form or the legal format of of the transaction right um so 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 we want to take into consideration sort of what is expected, what will happen as a result of this contract. So just so just keep that in mind, right? And so the first thing that we want to talk about is, now, now we've sort of, we spoke a little bit about this, but I'm just gonna sort of recap what we spoke about earlier on in the lecture. We said that we can, we must have a contract and the contract is the meeting of, a, of minds, right? It's, it's, it's an agreement between two or more parties right it, it can't be less than two so we can't have an agreement with ourselves um so agreement between two or more parties and that agreement creates a legal right or legal obligation okay so it's, so that's why we put the word enforceable there it must have an enforceable right or an enforceable obligation okay so that is the the um uh, that is sort of the the basis of of the contract right and then i and then we say listen we can have a written contract okay we can have a a oral contract which is something that we speak about or an implied contract um uh, uh, but it has to meet um the the criteria that we're going to talk about uh, just now now let me just tell you uh, the story that i had so i went um to on campus, there's a coffee shop. I'm not going to mention where, where it is, but it's not far from my office. So I think you guys can sort of work out where it is. Um, and I went there and I bought something and um, the lady never gave me a receipt. Lady never gave me a receipt, but then I realized that when I went there, I didn't actually say anything. I took the thing that I wanted, I put it on the counter, the lady was busy talking to someone else, you know, uh, at the back of her, and then she just scanned my thing, and then I handed her my card, and she and she swiped my card, and then I walked out with the thing that that I had bought, and I realized it. So, so it wasn't written, right? Because there was no, there, I didn't receive a receipt, I didn't receive a slip, nothing. There was wasn't written. It also wasn't an oral contract because I never, because I never spoke, and she never spoke. So it must have been implied. Right? And so a contract that's implied is something that we need to look at. What, what are the common business practices in this industry? Right? What are the customary business practices in this industry? When in the industry, when is it assumed that a contract exists? Right? And so in that situation, because sort of all of us have gone to the shop and bought something, you know that by the time you pay the, for the thing, that you've purchased and you walk out of the store, a contract has already been concluded, right? The contract has already, the, the contract is concluded and, I, and I, so, so it's clear that during the time that I walked into the, into the coffee shop, 
And during the time I walked out of the coffee shop, a contract was created, it was agreed with, and the rights and obligations were met, or, or in, in accounting terms, it was satisfied, right? And then I walked out. So between that time that I entered and I exited, there was revenue should have been recognized, right? And so, and so this is an implied. So we can have a written, an oral, and an implied uh, contract. Okay. So let me just uh, quick, quickly have a look at what's what's going on in the chat. So it says, how does an oral contract work? Is, is it more of having a witness who attests? No. So uh, an oral contract, uh, for, for, from a legal perspective, the, the lawyers are going to tell you um, what they believe. But from an accounting perspective, um, as long as there's an agreement, as long as the two people have come to an agreement, and it doesn't, we, we don't need, it doesn't need to be recorded anyway. And there even doesn't need to be uh, a, a witness. As long as... Um, it is agreed that an agreement was was reached is, is when a contract exists. Um, then someone says, so was it implied? Yes, my contract with the coffee shop up the way here was 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 implied. It was an implied contract. Um, no, remember a contract is an agreement, nothing to do with integration. Um, yeah, I think what the person is trying to say is what I was trying to say. <laughs> it's for, from a legal perspective, maybe a witness is required, but but from an accounting perspective, a witness is not required. Okay, so then one of the rules is that if someone is allowed to cancel a contract, that there's been no satisfaction of any obligation without a penalty, then the contract never existed. Okay, so. Again, let, let's go back to my uh, scenario of me going to the coffee shop. So I went to the coffee shop and I was looking for, um, I don't know what to call it. It's like this Rice crispy thing that they they put it in like sugar. It's like Rice crispy treat, right? So so I, I went into the coffee shop and it wasn't there, right? So then I left the coffee shop without buying anything. In that situation, there was a contract that could have been entered to, into by me coming there and inspecting the stuff and looking through it. But because I cancelled it before any payment had been made and before I took the Rice Krispie treat um, and, and there was no penalty involved, in that situation, the contract never existed from an accounting perspective. Okay? So so that that is what that is talking about. That... Um, where, where it doesn't exist. Okay, and so now this is the five criteria that I was talking about uh, of a contract. So remember, we spoke about the five steps in IFRS 15. Now, these are five criteria to identify if a contract exists. Very different, right? So here we are within step one. This is five criteria sitting within step one. It's under step one, okay? Uh, so, so it's not. Don't get it confused with the five-step uh, uh, model. This is five criteria within step one, right? And so, basically, the five criteria to identify if there's a contract is basically broken up into two main uh, questions, right? Do we have a legally enforceable? If you can't see, you must just zoom out because I'm writing at the bottom of the slide. Um, do we have a legally enforceable? contract right and this is where we want the lawyers to to weigh in right is there a legally enforceable contract here right and sort of what do we look for when there's a legally enforceable contract we're going to come to that just now and then the other big question that we need to ask is is there commercial substance is there some economic substance to this contract right or and this is a possibility or have the lawyers written a contract out that is actually, it has no economic substance, but they wrote it in such a way that it tricks the accountant into thinking that there's an economic substance, right? So that's, that's why the second leg of the, of, the, of the tests that we're going to perform uh, looks at, is there economic value in this contract, right? Okay, so, so let's now look at the first question, you know, is, is there uh, a legally binding contract? The first thing the lawyers are going to ask us to look at is, you know, have the two parties approved the contract, 
right? And again, the approval doesn't need to be in writing. It can be oral or implied, right? So has the two parties approved the contract? Uh, um, and, you, you know, so, so, so have they entered into the contract? Are they agreeable with the contract? Right, and so that's the first criteria that we need to look at. The next criteria is, um, you know, and each contract will have rights and obligations. So the next criteria talks about, are those rights and obligations identifiable? Can we identify what the rights and obligations are? Can, can we say, okay, uh, you know, we want, we want uh, the contract is to purchase, uh, you know, uh, an airplane, right? So, so can we identify that it, it is an airplane that is being sold here? Right? And sometimes, uh, again, the contract will be written in such a vague way, especially when you're dealing with sort of uh, intangible assets, you know, uh, things like cryptocurrencies and, and um, you know, uh, rights or, or copyright law and that sort of stuff. It can be quite difficult to identify what actually is the thing that is being transferred. You know, what is the performance obligation here? Um, and so that's why the next the criteria two right, is asking about what are the obligations, what, what, what is being transferred, right? Um, and then obviously, if you're transferring something, we're going to transfer it for some sort of value, right? some sort of money, right? And so uh, the third uh, part to, to, to having a, an enforceable contract, a legally enforceable contract, is that there must be a price, right? And now remember, we said that the contract price that we identify here is not always the same as the transaction price, okay? So the contract price is what we will identify in criteria three, but it's not always what we identify in step three, right? Remember, remember I said, don't get confused. This is, so I'm going back. This is step three. Step three here talks about transaction price, whereas criteria uh, three uh, talks about contract price. You see? Okay. Um, okay, cool. If you have any questions, please just pop it in the chat. Okay. So um, now we've dealt with whether we can, is it legally workable? Can we legally enforce it, right? So that's those first three criteria are dealing with that. And yes, I know the BCom law students are going to say, but these criteria are not complete. There's missing, there's gaps in the criteria. It's okay. For accounting, it's fine. Right. It's it's fine. It's good enough for accounting. Right. So the next thing is that we want to ask. So now that we dealt with the legal stuff, is we want to deal with the economic stuff, right? Does it make sense economically? Okay. Um, and 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 the stuff that we now ask is, is there a commercial substance? So what what does that mean? Is there a commercial substance? How do we uh, define commercial substance, right? And so the idea behind commercial substance is that there's some sort of risk that comes with owning uh, uh, the right or, or, or taking part in the obligation, right? For example, you go into a shop, right, and you want to buy a vase, right? For those that don't know what a vase is, it's a sort of like a, a uh, you put like flowers in it. It's like a container for flowers. It's like a fancy, let's assume it's a glass container for flowers, right? So we have this glass container that we want to purchase, right? Uh, the, the question that is being asked by criteria for is when is the risk that the vase breaks? When is it your fault? When does it become your fault if the vase breaks, right? And so you need to, you need to talk yourself through uh, the contract, you know, is it when I pay? Yes, it's it's possibly, it's definitely when you pay. By that time, it's definitely happened. But you'll find that in some stores and some shops, especially the glass shops, it'll say if you break it, you must pay, or you you bought it, right? So in that situation, the risk has actually passed even before you bought it. You see. The risk, the commercial substance has already happened before the person has bought it. Okay, and, and that can create issues sometimes. That, that is a tricky thing and can create issues. So, so the question is, when does the risk pass, right? 
uh, um, and does the risk pass eventually, right? So firstly, does the risk pass, and then when does it pass? When you talk about the when does it pass, that comes up five of the big picture, right? Uh, when does the risk pass? Here we're asking, does the risk pass? Um, and then the next one is, um, you know, when does the money pass? So when, so so basically, step four again, just like it was in the previous sort of five element thing. Step four is asking when does the, does the, the the payment happen and does the rights actually pass? So that, that's sort of what's being asked here. And then finally, the last one, and, and uh, I must just also tell you guys that your book focuses a lot on collectability, right? Especially on page. Uh, it's in fact after this. It's on. It's, it's, it's in uh, section eight. Your book focuses a lot, lot on collectability. We're not going to focus as much on collectability in, in back two hundred, right? But but the the idea is, um, when does um, th does the entity reasonably expect to to get this money, right? Is there some expectation that the money will be paid and the goods and services will be transferred to the customer, right? So if there's no expectation, then there's no contract. Okay. Um, let's just have a look. So, so the, these are basically uh, sort of a repetition of what we just said um, in that if someone cancels the contract, then there wasn't a contract to begin with. So if someone cancels it without a penalty, then there really wasn't, wasn't a contract to begin with. Um, and if, uh, so the important part of this slide is if the criteria are not met, we need to continue assessing the criteria until such time that they are met, right? And then that raises a major question. Right? What happens to a contract if at inception or when the contract starts, the criteria is not met? How do we account for it, right? And so we account for it like this. Um, on this slide, we say, if, we, if the criteria are not met, um, we would wait for the customer to pay us. If the customer does pay us and the criteria are still not met, the five criteria, remember all the criteria need to be met. The criteria are sitting on page uh, 135, right? But we are now talking about page 136, right? So, so if the criteria are not met right, at the beginning of the contract and we've now received money, we've received, so that word consideration uh, in accounting means money. Right? We received some sort of money, some sort of cash from the customer, and the criteria was not met. We now have a liability, right? Because we can't recognize revenue. Because remember, the first step in the, in the five step model is is there a contract? And if we say no, then we can't proceed, right? So we can't recognize revenue. Instead, we need to recognize a liability. And so the liability that we're going to recognize is called. A refund liability. It can sometimes be called uh, revenue received in advance or refund liability. Right. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to debit bank, obviously, because we were receiving money. And then we're going to credit our refund liability or revenue received in advance. Okay. And so that is sort of that sort of uh, um, what, what we would do. And the question is, why are we recognizing the liability? It's because we have not what would that, so we're going to do a, an example just now. Um, the question is why we recognize a liability? It's because we are now owing someone something, right? We're owing someone uh, uh, goods and services. And so in, 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 in effect, we, we have a liability. We've created a liability. Okay. Um, and then what happens? So one of two things can happen. Either we, the contract does get created uh, and and we, we, we meet the five criteria. And how would we do that? Just like when I walked out of the um, uh, coffee shop, I knew that by the time I walked out of the coffee shop, a contract was concluded. Sometimes what happens is you'll only know that a contract was concluded after the fact, right? So in this situation where the criteria is not met at the beginning of a contract, we need to wait for one or two things to happen. We need to wait for either we realize, oh, 
yes, there was definitely a contract and it was concluded and came to an end, or um, there was definitely not a contract. Right? So only one of two things can happen. When do those two things happen? The first is if there are no remaining obligations, meaning that if, uh, let me just go back to that, if we, if there's no, there's no more goods to give, right? We've given all the goods that we need to give in terms of the contract. There's no more obligations left, right? Then the contract has come to an end and it's clear that there was a contract. Um, if we have a situation where the money is non-refundable, so we can't, we don't, we never need to give it back to the, to, to, to the customer, then the contract is, is, um, is there. And then I say, finally, we can have a situation where we don't give the customer any goods and services, right? The, the contract was terminated before satisfaction of the obligation, right? Uh, however, the money that we've received is still non-refundable. Uh, so, so in the first instance, we have no more obligations, we have no more give, goods to give, and it's non-refundable. In the second instance, we haven't given anything, anyone, anything, but the money that we received is non-refundable. In th both those cases, a contract has been created and all other of the five step model has been met. And so we can recognize revenue. How would we do that? We would decrease the refund liability and, and change that into revenue. Right? Remember this refund liability can also be called um, revenue received in advance. Okay. So that was a situation where the criteria was not met at the beginning. Now let's look at a situation where the criteria was met at the beginning, but after that, it, it now is no more met. So you might ask, so when does this happen? When can it be met at the beginning and then later on, it's no more met? All right. So let's go back to that criteria. I just want to quickly point out something. So let's say we have a contact with a company in Russia. Right. At the beginning, uh, before the Ukraine war, um, all the criteria was met. Right. Then the war uh, took place in Ukraine. And Russia has now been kicked out of the SWIFT system. So that calls into question which criteria? Criteria number five. Because right. now, is it probable that we will ever get paid? And the answer is probably not. Okay, because now they can, there's no way that they can pay us because they are kicked out of SWIFT. Okay, and we are a South African company, we rely on SWIFT, right? So in that situation, a the contract at the beginning met all of the criteria, right? And we might have had a situation where we actually even recognized their first payment, we recognized revenue, right? But then after that, something changed and um, it's no more, it's no more meeting the criteria. Does that make sense? Um, yes, the slides have been available. Um, they've, they've been online. They are online. Um, so, so then what do we do in that situation? In that situation, we, we must uh, keep the revenue that we've already recognized. So we don't, we don't go back and reverse that revenue. We keep it where it is. However, we cannot recognize any new revenue. Right? So no new revenue, which means when we get any payments uh, or, or when we uh, meet any of the obligations, right? So when we deliver any of the goods, um, I don't know how we deliver goods to Russia now, but let's just assume we, we can. So if we deliver the goods, we would then debit the debtors, meaning we're going to increase the debtor. And instead of crediting revenue, we have to now credit the refund liability or revenue um, in the rears. Okay. Okay. And then again, we need to keep reassessing the contract to make sure that it doesn't meet the criteria any time in the future. Right. And so that's um, that sort of revenue uh, so far, the contract. Now, I just want to quickly go back to the slide here where we said Sometimes the lawyers can trick the accountants and put many contracts, but there actually are only one contract. Uh, and this is where we talk about combining the con. When do we combine the contracts? We combine the contracts when we have a contract that is around about the same time, 
in a roundabout the, with the same customer or related parties, right? And then it must have the same commercial substance, right? There must be the same commercial substance that is happening. I'm cognizant of the time, so that's why I'm going a little bit faster. Um, so we must have the same commercial substance that is taking place. And then we, we know that the performance obligation or the goods are somehow interrelated. They, they, it's, it's, it's like one good, one service that is provided. Um, and we're going to look at we're going to look at an example now. Um, and so then, if that is the case, we would assume that materially all of these contracts is now one contract, and we'd combine it. Right? And so let's have a look at this quick example here. So we say we've got software company which enters into a agreement to license accounting software. So like if you guys make this a real world example, we have Sage, which Sage Accounting which says, oh, we're we'll, we'll going to uh, offer you an accounting software. But then a few days later with the same customer, right? A few days later, they then decide that, oh, we also want to offer you consulting services. And they agree to have consulting services. Now from a legal perspective, this will look like two separate contracts. One for the one for the license agreement and one for the consulting services. But if you think of it, what's happening here is that the two are highly interrelated, right? And um, the, 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 the software would not be able to be used if there wasn't any consulting services. So the consulting services is to customize the software for the company's purposes. And without that customization, the software wouldn't work. So in effect, the software on its own is useless without the consulting services. And then obviously, the consulting services is useless without the software because you can't consult uh, on nothing. Uh, so, so, so therefore, they are highly interrelated, highly linked. And we, as uh, in the accounting stream, we would record that as one obligation because they're so interlinked that they don't offer any economic value on their own. They have to go together. You see, does everybody understand that, that that concept? If you do, just put a yes in the chat so that. So, so, so the question you must ask yourself is: Can it operate on its own? Can it exist on its own? You know, does it work on its own? And if it doesn't, then it must be interrelated with another with another obligation, with another performance obligation. Right now, we're going to do another quick example. And now, guys, this is an important thing that I need to say to you. Um, as a lecturer, I can't tell you what's coming out, right? I can't tell you what's coming out in the testing exam, but I can tell you what's very important. This is this is important. Okay, so just pay careful attention to to these types, this sort of example. Um, anyway, so let's have a look. We say um, on 31 July 2018, Hatfield Medical Center signed a 24-month contract with magazine. RUs. Now, now we work for magazine RU, right? You're gonna have to figure that out just now. We work for magazine RU. So anyway, Hatfield Medical Center signed a 24-month contract with magazine RUs for the delivery of 10 magazines on a monthly basis. The total of 240 magazines will therefore be delivered over a 24-month contract period. Okay. So the contract period is 24 months. The transaction price of the contract. It amounts to 7,200 Rand. Uh, Hatfield Medical Center paid this amount in cash on the 31st of July. 31st of July is the first day, the, the date of inception. So they paid in advance, all right? The deliveries will take place on the 15th of each month and the first delivery is on the 15th of August, 2018, okay? So the first, the first delivery is on, on um, the 15th of August, 2018. So then it says magazine RUs um, will use the in out, sorry, output method. In the, in the previous lecture, I kept saying input method. I just couldn't get it right. Anyway, so they're going to use the output method based on the number of magazines delivered to the customer um, to recognize the revenue all the time. This Notice what is the basis that they are using? What is the basis that they use? 
we're using the number of magazines. So I've got a question in the lecture earlier on, earlier on in the morning. Why don't we use the number of months? And the answer to that question is because the question is telling us to use the number of magazines, number one. Number two, it's not always the case that we have an equal number of magazines issued in a month. So, so basically, I'm saying in this question, it is the case that 10 is being delivered every month. But in another question, if they might say, oh, we're going to deliver 10 on month one, but only two in month two, and then five in month three. And so, and so that's why it's important to you listen carefully what the question is telling you about the basis that they are using. Okay. So the basis that they are using is the output method, which means the number of magazines delivered. We're going to talk a little bit more about the input and output method when we go into step four uh, and even five. So don't focus too much on it now. All we need to know is that they're using the number of magazines delivered, and this method is applied consistently. Again, we're going to talk about consistency of application in step five. Okay, so the required is we need to pass the journal entries for, for, for the 31st of July and then the 31st of August. Now let's think about it, right? So we received the money on the 31st of July. So what would we debit? We debit bank. You know, like most of the students, you know, my students are teaching me things about accounting I never know. So, you know, most of the students tell me that, so when in doubt, just always debit bank. So just for any trans, just debit bank. So, 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 so now <laughs> we're just gonna debit bank, right? No, we're debiting bank because we're receiving the money. Okay, uh, we're debiting bank because we're receiving money on the thirty first of July. Um, and then we're going to credit. What are we gonna credit? We're gonna credit that refund liability. Or in this question, I wanted to change it up so that you see the different ways of doing it. We're going to credit the revenue received in advance. It's both this, it's a, all the same thing. It's still a liability, right? But I just wanted you to see that the account can be labeled two different things, right? I'll show you the journal entry just now. But let's move on to the next journal entry of, uh, at the 31st of August, right? So now at the 31st of August, we've already recognized the revenue received in advance, or sometimes you can call it the refund liability. But now we've actually performed on that obligation. We've actually met the obligation of delivering 10 magazines. So that's no more revenue received in advance. It's now revenue earned. So we need to move it out of revenue received in advance and put it in revenue, okay? So what would we do? Let's let's do that calculation, right? So 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 they said we've got now take out your calculators because I'm going to ask you to type the answer in the chat. Let me just I have my calculators here. Okay, All right, there we go. Okay, so we have we, we we were told that the contract is worth seven thousand two hundred, right? So we've got seven thousand two hundred rand, and we also told that there's going to be a total of two hundred and forty magazines right so how much is it per one magazine it's 30 rand. now my question to you is at the end of august how many magazines do we deliver and therefore how much revenue have we earned now type your answer in the chat how many magazines did we deliver well don't tell me how many magazines we delivered just tell me how much revenue have we earned what is the rand amount of revenue earned right and so, and so you can see here, people are saying 300. That is correct. We, 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 per magazine, it's 30 rand. We've delivered 10 magazines. Therefore, we sh we've earned 10 times 30, 300. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So th those of us that were a bit confused, we earned 300. So what we'll do then is we would debit the, the revenue received in advance or the liability, right? Let's put an L here, right? So it's a liability. We debit that one and then we credit the revenue, right? And this is a income account. And so we put an I there, okay, for 300. Does that make sense to everyone? 
you have any questions, just pop it in the chat. But in the meantime, I'm going to go. I'm just worried we are quite over time. So I just want to, again, guys, I can't tell you what's coming out in the testing exam, but I can tell you what's important. And this part B is, is important, right? So, so let's read it. It says, calculate the total revenue and the revenue received in advance, remember we can also call that the refund liability, that RU magazines or magazines RU would have recognized and presented in their financial statements for the financial year ended 31 December 2018. So how, in 31 December, how many at 31 December, how many magazines would we have delivered? Remember, we can't use months because we were told that we were going to use the number of magazines delivered. So then the question is, how many magazines would have been delivered in December at the end of December? So let's count together, right? The first one was delivered in August, September, October, November, December. So how many magazines do you think we would have delivered at the end of December? We would have delivered 50 magazines. Okay. So 50 magazines, and each magazine is worth 30 uh, rand of the transaction price. So we say 30 times 50, that gives us 1,500 rand. So uh, in December, we have earned revenue of 1,500. Right? Earned revenue one. So that's our first answer. Our first answer here is going to be one five. Right. The remainder, right, of the seven thousand two hundred is going to be a revenue received in advance, and that's going to be five thousand seven hundred. So let's have a look here. This is exactly what they've done here. They've said that uh, that was the total amount received. Right. Um, 1,500 is revenue that is recognized or earned, right? That's what we've earned. And then the remainder is going to be revenue received in advance. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, I will open as soon as, so after this year, we're going straight into consultation. During that time, if there's no questions, I'll start preparing it. Um, and then I'll open it just after lunch. So if you come around about half past one, two o'clock, it should be open. Okay, uh, then I just want to tell you guys about tomorrow's lecture. So for tomorrow, you're going to read, so basically homework for today, you're going to do example one, two and three in your textbook, right? Uh, I want you to focus on example two and three. Example one is important, um, but but don't, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit outside of our scope. Example two is also pretty important, um, but example two, and so if you do example two in detail and then three, you need to really focus and make sure that you understand three, um, uh, in fact, three and four. So you're gonna do three and four for me, right? And remember that we're not reading, um, we aren't reading 5.7, okay? So what pages are the examples on? We're going to look at page 130, I'm gonna give you a number of pages, page 137, 136, and then 133 in the new textbook. So 133, 136, 137. Those are the pages that you need to focus on for the examples. All right. Um, then in the in the in the textbook you're not gonna do modifying uh, contract modifications. All right. Contract modification starts on page 138 and we're not reading that. We are not reading uh, any of that 138, 139. Okay, so we're not doing 138, 139. In the meantime, for tomorrow's lecture, you're reading the whole of section six, right, from page 140 to 143, and you're doing all of the examples. And tomorrow, um, you don't need your textbook, but your homework for tomorrow is going to be real homework. Like today, I was just trying to give you guys a break and give you like sort of something easy to do. Uh, and then from tomorrow, you're going to do 
real work for me. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. That's sort of the end of the lecture.